Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Mind, Body, Soul podcast. I'm delighted to have Edith Lakatos on the podcast today. Edith is a social entrepreneur and mental health advocate, um, and I'm absolutely chuffed to have her on. We did a stage together, uh, which is uh, French for traineeship, uh, back in 2015, and we had a good connection then. And it's amazing that eight years later that we're, we've are we reconnected through, I suppose, a passion for all things mental health. Uh, we're going to be talking about a few various different things today, uh, looking at things like anxiety, depression, and PTSD, and then some hopefully some helpful um, tips around managing that. And Eddie helped me a few years ago with an article on uh, burnout and returning from burnout. I've had that myself, and some of the tips that she gave at that stage were incredible. That was turned into an article. And um, so, Eddie, absolutely delighted to have you on the podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much. I, I'm really appreciating uh, this opportunity, and uh, I'm happy to see you again. Oh, amazing, amazing. Well, look, let's get straight into business here. Um, so as you know, I'm, I'm delighted to have you on the show. Um, can you tell us, Eddie, just a little bit about your journey to date uh, in terms of mental health and life in general? I mean, I know it's super interesting, but it's also for, you know, the, the listeners who may not know you yet. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so basically I was born and raised in Hungary um, and uh, I went to study in France and then I ended up in Belgium. So this is where we met and uh, there I, I started to work. So I'm still in Belgium. I'm working here and I was always, always a super good student and, you know, a people pleaser, um, perfectionist. Um, so, you know, the type, right, mm -hmm. um, which which will actually one point um end up in burnout i mean the the type is really sensitive uh to to this issue so uh, the, this personality could very often end up uh, in burnout so this this is actually what happened to me and uh, four years ago i went through burnouts um and it it shed a light to uh, another problem that i experienced um, when I was small, so I was a victim of domestic violence. So my father was an abusive man who was uh, abusing uh, us. Uh, so me, my my mother and my brother as well. So, I mean, we were lucky because my mother left him. So she had enough courage and um, and enough support to be able to, to leave. Um, so then I was um, developing this kind of personality style to keep with my throne to to uh, how to say to um keep going um uh, even though i experienced trauma so um which actually led me later in life um uh, to burn out um mm -hmm. so basically uh, my my journey is that yeah i experienced burnout four years ago and then i i started therapy and i i'm still doing therapy now well, wow. well, look, first of all, I'm very sorry that you had to go through that at such a young age. Um, and I think you're very courageous to be speaking about it now. Um, so thanks for that. And, um, you know, as well, I think it's hugely important that people like yourself and myself do talk about mental mental health uh, issues, because I think, you know, they're they're They are out there and there's other people suffering and sometimes suffering in silence. So. Um, yeah, no, thanks for sharing that, Eddie. And then I suppose I have like I have a follow up question on that. So, you know, can you tell us a bit more about these terms, you know, that you hear often anxiety, depression and um, post-traumatic stress disorder and, you know, maybe link in, have they affected you? And I suppose how are they different and are they linked in certain ways as well? Yeah, sure. So basically for me, the burnout was just the tip of the iceberg. So I didn't really address uh, my PTSD, so um, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder um, in, in, in my uh, first 30 years. And this led me to burnout. But uh, actually, um, there, there are a lot of symptoms uh, in burnout as well that um, uh, can be um, also um, can be mistaken with depression um, and other mental health issues. So actually, uh, when I, I was diagnosed with burnout, 
Um, some of the doctors said I had depression and some of them said, no, it's just burnout. out. And then I started, um, of course, therapy. And uh, of course, I learned that there are different um, different uh, mental health issues with uh, symptoms that can overlap. So basically, with uh, my uh, changes, negative changes in thinking and the mood, it can um, it can be a symptom uh, in the case of depression or uh, in the case of PTSD, but also in the case of burnout. So I had to learn the differences. Uh, and for example, um, the, the, the difference in the case of PTSD, uh, which was in my case, uh, um, so the difference between, between PTSD and depression is that you know uh, what caused uh, this mallet of the person. So you have a specific uh, happening uh, in the past that uh, that caused uh, this behavior in you or this kind of uh, coping mechanism. So I had a trauma in a very specific time of my life that actually um, um, uh, had affected how I developed uh, my personality. And in a case of depression, we don't know exactly what kind of life happening uh, contributed to that? So it's a bit, little bit more blurry than PTSD, actually. Mm, it's it's interesting you say that because, like, I remember coming back to Ireland uh, a few, it was probably uh, twenty twenty one, yeah, January, and I had a real period of, and I it was like, at the time it felt like depression, and still to this day I'm not a hundred percent whether it was like a some a kind of a feeling of a almost like a breakdown slash mm. depression but it was really intense for about a month to two months where I had to just drop everything from my calendar and recover and it like to this day yeah. I don't know exactly what it was but it felt like a mixture of several things and like you mentioned there like I, I I'm uh, I take antidepressant medication as well to this day and um you know it was helpful for me getting my clarity of thought back because you mentioned that idea of the negative thoughts taken over and that that's exactly what happened to me and I suppose I would personally look at myself as at my normal state as having a positive disposition. Um, so, yeah, yeah it's, it's really interesting to hear you um, clarify some of those um, some of those terms. And I suppose another one that that I have in there is is anxiety. Um, and I know that would definitely be one that, that I have. And I suppose people relate to it sometimes in terms of that, the beating yeah. heart or like a specific social situation. But I suppose how would you yeah. look on that one, Edith? Yeah, for for me, of course, it's it's related to to my trauma, and um, so my coping mechanism became to um, do everything perfectly and to prevent um, every um, um, any unforeseeable event to um, have a negative impact on my life. So. Mm -hmm. In short, I mean, I'm not sure I, I'm telling you uh, in the correct English words, but I think oh, in yeah, short, right. it means that I want to keep everything under control. So if everything is under control in my life, um, I will not experience uh, distress or anxiety. So what, what I have uh, is that I really worry about the future, what's going to happen today, tomorrow. If things are not under, under control in my work or in my pri private life, I feel the stress. I feel that, for example, I'm sweating more, or um, I um, I have nightmares during the night. I have some sleep issues. I have um, uh, some kind of restlessness. So I cannot really stay in one spot. I need to move around, and I feel that I am I am restless. Yeah. So it's also a very uh, specific symptom of anxiety that I didn't know actually before. Yeah, it's just I'm 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 obviously not smiling because I I know you're going through this, but I smile because I actually feel like I I have the same thing, you know, that idea of I used to, when I came out of college, I used to prepare for interviews like you wouldn't believe, like I'd have my sheet of things that I needed to do, and it was like that. It was trying to control every element of the interview, everything that could possibly come up, every question, and then like go above and beyond what they'd expect as well, you know, and it worked. But the problem is, if you go into every element of your life like that, you know, like you said earlier, you can you can end up burnt out because it's impossible. I was yeah. saying recently that good enough is good enough. Um, 
And I think sometimes yeah. when you're a perfectionist, it's like only perfection is good enough. And, and perfection is a myth because no matter how well you prepare, you, you there's probably still something you'll feel like you could have done better. So, um, yeah, so I think perfectionism is definitely heavily interlinked. And that element of control, which you mentioned as well, Edith, I think is super um, important um, as well to realize that we, no matter how much we try and manage for unforeseen circumstances, that we can't control everything. And that probably after a certain point, it becomes counterproductive because, yeah, you know, indeed. you probably end up burnt out from how much you're trying to trying to control uh, the uncontrollable. Um, exactly. So, yeah, no, amazing, amazing. Thanks so much for that. Um, would you have anything to add there? Are you happy to move on to our next topic? Mm, yeah, there. I mean, there are so many things to add uh, about burnout as well. But I think what, what I really struggled with when, when I went through burnout is that uh, nobody told me anything about the process and what's the process in your mind. And, um of course, uh, the mind can recover, but you need to give it time. And I, I had to um, take almost one year of break and I was sleeping 12 hours per uh, night every day for six months. Mm -hmm. And then it it was a little bit better and I had energy um, to do um, the everyday stuff and start doing sports, etc. But for me, what, what was really also increasing my anxiety as I didn't know, I mean, will I be able to function again as a normal person? I mean, normal, there is no normal, yeah. <laughs> but no, no, um, how, how can I be um, um, as, uh, as, as I was before, you know, I, yeah, I was always back to, back, back to being the super good students, you know, <laughs> um, at work and everywhere, you know, the good girl. So how, how, when, when is going to happen again to me? So I was super anxious about this as well. So I think um, what people should just know about burnout and, and, uh, and other mental health issues is just you need to give it time. And actually the, the brain um, is recovering. And uh, of course, you need to apply uh, different tools uh, to surround yourself to the good people, therapy, medication, different tools that we we might talk about it later. Yeah. But just to know that there are actually a lot of tools that can help you and actually the functionalities will come back. You just need to give it time. Yeah, amazing. Well, and I want to ask you just to sort of uh, del kind of delve in a little bit to something that you've mentioned there is, so you mentioned getting back to the, the good girl or the perfect girl. Like, was part of your burnout recovery maybe recalibrating your mindset on things? Yeah, absolutely. I, I really um, became lazy, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> I mean, I I give myself the permission to rest. Yes. That, that definitely changed. So if I, I'm, I'm much more in connection with my body because i think in in my first 30 years my coping mechanism is was shutting down every connection with my body so i didn't feel anything and i mean this is a normal thing i was learning about this uh later on um because if a child is abused the actually the the mental um, uh, mechanism will be that the child uh, will shut all the emotions, all the link between the body and mind to be able to stay alive. So uh, this is what happened when I was a child. And then this was never restored because I never really worked on myself. So I never really sensed that there was a problem of fatigue, of being overwhelmed. And then actually after the burnout with my therapist, uh, I, I managed to reconnect these two. So now I feel much more intensely as well i don't know maybe it's the normal because i didn't feel anything before but i feel very intensely this connection when i feel tired i i feel exhausted and then i feel i need to have a rest now i need to have a nap or when i feel mentally overwhelmed i feel really um intensely and when i look at the monitor when i'm working uh, I also feel that I need to have a break uh, from from the computer. So I think the burnout was actually a blessing for me because it helped me to reconnect mm -hmm. my body and my mental um, mental self. Oh wow, 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 wow! That's so powerful. I mean, 
And it's funny, again, something you say resonates with me. I used to, like, back, I'm better at it now, still not great, but sometimes, you know, I would feel guilty having a lazy Sunday. So I'd be worried that, you know, particularly when I was younger and living at home, what would my parents think of me chilling out for a couple of hours? Would they think I'm lazy? You know, things like that. And, you know, this pressure that you put on yourself by thinking what other people will think as well, like, I, I should be this super productive guy all the time, like a super, like absolutely impossible in hindsight. But at the time I didn't realize, you know, and that's why it's so, so great to hear you say these things. And I hope it's it's resonating and I'm sure it is with with some of the listeners. Um, so it, just, it moves me on to actually a, a sort of a very interesting question, because we've obviously been in contact before the show to get this organized and uh Sorry, it reminds me, actually, I have to just point out something to people uh, quickly who are watching on YouTube. There's a little um, barcode here you'll probably see on my screen. So that's for anybody who's listening who wants to get 10 quick free health and wellness tips from my website. If you scan that code, you, you can get that. Sorry, Edith, I meant to mention that at the start for listeners, but I just I, I better get that in there now before we move on to our next question. But yeah, so just when we were talking about all of these, um. You know, how has the work from neurologist um, Andrew Hoverman helped you on your healing journey? And, you know, what tips could you potentially take from that to help other people on their own healing journey? Yeah, I really love him. <laughs> but uh, from the from the day I discovered his podcast, I'm an, an absolute fan. And I would even go to his conferences if I lived in the US. But unfortunately, he's so far away. So Someday. he's giving he'll conferences. Europe, he'll go over there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, one day. Or when he when he comes to Europe, I can go to his event. So basically he's a neuroscientist and um so he's um describing everything in a, in a really uh, easy language mm -hmm. so i really wish i had a professor like him because he's just genius in the communicating so um actually in in the different uh, podcast episodes he's um talking about the different mental health issues um the by basically the science behind it uh, how to tackle the 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 different disorders how to tackle it with medication how to tackle it with uh, with other behavior tools and um what what is the research saying so how where is the research now about it so actually he's basically giving a lecture about specific topics like there is a lecture on depression a lecture on burnout a lecture on um addiction etc so he's giving a background okay what is what is the source of addiction, etc.? What is the research um, uh, saying about it? So mm -hmm. I was really interested because, of course, I'm a good student. So I want to know everything about the topic. Mm -hmm. So I also was like, oh, my God, I mean, I have this issue. I should know about everything that is out there so I can also kind of treat myself and um, cure myself in a way. Of course, it's not possible because you also need a therapist you need a professional but yeah. he's also giving in his, in his podcast he's giving really um practical tools that right. that i really um used and it it, it it helped me and um i mean the reference that uh, i mean the, he's saying in the podcast that the evidence shows is that it's working so actually he's not just talking bullshit he is yeah. a professor he's a neuroscientist so he's talking about evidence-based tools yeah yeah exactly so it's none of that suedo science it's the real it's the real deal um uh, and does he these they're like his episodes i haven't had the chance to listen but for sure after talking to you i'll definitely be be plugging in and checking it out does he interview people or is it like as you say is it like a lecture where it's him speaking about these specific topics yeah, the first episodes, I think a dozen of the first episodes were just him giving a lecture. And then he started inviting other professors. Okay. So when he was talking about um, tackling depression, he was inviting uh, a professor or even there was an episode in called Exposure. And it's, um, it's a good impact on mental health. And mm -hmm. then he invited a person who is doing research on cold Exposure. So actually, he's 
he is now having a discussion, a one-on-one discussion with another professor, and he's also doing some open conferences. So where he's going and the audience can ask questions about these things. So it's actually um, opening up a discussion about mental health. Is, of course, it can be dangerous, but but I think the way he's doing, it's actually very educative. Mm-hmm. So it has a very good impact. And he's always saying that you should, uh, of course, consult your pharmacist, your doctor, your mental health um, yeah. pro- professional without taking any uh, tool or without uh, just implementing whatever he says, because everybody is very different. So you need to customize the approach. Yeah, well, it's interesting you say that as well, because, yeah, like I think we'd both advocate for that approach. It sounds like we've had similar, I suppose, journeys in certain elements. And and in terms of recovery, like you said, like my GP played a big part in helping to get me back on track and help me to feel better again. Um, and obviously we don't advocate listening to this podcast as as a solution, but for getting some good information out there. Of course, you're contacting if you're really struggling, you're talking to someone close to you, um, you know, and if you need that medical help, you're getting in touch with your GP or or, or a psychologist or um, you know, or a psychotherapist or whoever can can help you or a counselor, whatever it is. Um mm-hmm. but, yeah, and I think what you say as well about mental health conversations, for sure, what's important as well is a safe environment for people, isn't it, as well, that they want to feel safe in opening up about these conversations. So one thing that I always say to people is if you're struggling, particularly if you're suffering in silence, is imagine that it was your best friend or somebody that you love that was suffering and they felt they couldn't talk to you. Like how much would that hurt? So if you're that person who needs to talk to them, then offer them that sort of gratitude because they don't want you to be suffering in silence, you know? So don't be afraid to talk, I think is a huge one as well. Um. Well, yeah, so Eddie, sorry, I was going to ask you, so that show that you mentioned as well, um, like what were some of the practical things that you took from Andrew Hoberman's sh- show that you've kind of maybe implemented or that you found, oh, that was that was very interesting and very helpful? Yeah, there were a lot. Actually, I was even writing a blog about this. Um, okay. So uh, I, I was writing in the blog about six uh, practical tips I also used um, in, in my uh, mental health recovery. Mm-hmm. Um, so the the first thing that I actually use every day during the winter months is the light therapy because what he also says in the podcast that in the in the two or three hours after waking you need to have light in your eyes because this is what will help you to um, produce the important hormone that will help you elevate your mood help you do whatever just wake up from your bed and mm-hmm. and and do some actions. So I, I also have this light therapy lamp that I'm, I'm using during winter months because, yeah, in Northern Europe, I'm based in Belgium. There is not a lot of sun or light. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm using that. And I'm also um, uh, using vitamins and uh, supplements. So, for example, in the podcast, he's saying that omega-3 has a big um, impact on tackling uh, depression. And I didn't know that before that actually you can take some omega-3 tablets to to help you uh, elevate your mood. There you can also take vitamin C, vitamin D. Um, so there are a lot of uh, supplements that you can take. I mean, if you your depression is a major depression, then maybe you need to also take antidepressant medication. But um, if you have just some minor symptoms of e- even uh, winter depression, that could go away during summer, then you should definitely consider and discuss these supplements with your doctor. And then the other thing that I discovered that was really eye-opening for me was the meditation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, he's talking about this in in every episode of his podcast. Um, And he's not uh, paid (laughs) by any any organization doing that. So he's he's saying that it, it proved that it's effective on on um, mental health and it's actually rewiring your brain. Um, and I also read a book from a Belgian um, Belgian doctor mm. who uh, carried out the research uh, with monks. 
and um, he actually researched their brains during the meditation process and then he proved that actually their brain is very powerful Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. so I really believe in meditation Um, I'm not so good at it I'm I'm still trying to uh, increase the time so yeah but for me it works because it calms me down yeah. I have not gone to another level where you uh, you go to the nirvana or You're something like levitating. this. <laughs> no, no, no. But like what I think what a norm- normal person can do is to meditate for 10 minutes per day. And yeah. uh, I mean, this this is completely feasible during yeah. the yeah. afternoon or in the morning. So you can always find 10 minutes. There are like super applications out there. I, I um, use uh, some... Uh, some free ones from YouTube, or there is also the Headspace app. So yeah. there are a lot of things out there for that. Wow, wow, yeah, great, wow. No, I love that. I love that. Do you, do you have anything to add on them? There, great tips. Love it. Another one that I use is called the Calm app. Again, it's it is it's a paid subscription, but I'm not sponsored by them or anything. But I love it, um, and I use their yeah. stories quite a lot um there's a few that i love there's one by matthew mcconaughey as well he's got a very relaxing voice so um oh, so okay awesome. cool yeah yeah oh that's awesome yeah uh any more to add there on that eddie they're great and oh sorry one other that i would add to your supplements would be uh considering a vitamin um d supplement during the winter months as well it's known as the sunlight uh vitamin so that might be one for people to worth considering anyway or talk to their pharmacist about yeah, well, well, one other thing that was uh, really um, also an eye opener for me. I mean, this for some people it goes without saying that you need to have some quality connections with people. Yeah, I'm actually in Belgium, working in Belgium. You know, like being an expat here, yeah. it's uh, it's something that is very difficult um, to develop uh, really meaningful connections. And this is what Huberman is also saying in his podcast, that actually it's improving your mental health if you have quality connections. Mm -hmm. So I actually, after my burnout, I started to focus on my quality connections and leave behind those that were more artificial. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm working on that, but it it was really shocking and also positively surprising for me that the that some quality connection can improve your mental health mm. i mean for some people it could go without saying but for me it was a surprise amazing what, what what good advice and i think as well when sometimes when we feel depressed or low there's this inclination and it's hard to get the balance right but there's this inclination to want to um to sort of uh separate yourself right and to kind of yeah at a certain point that can become counterproductive and you know sometimes you need to get back around people to get your energy back but like you said you kind of want them to be the right people and um, i'm really happy that it helped you get to a place where you feel like you're harvesting those more genuine connections the ones that kind of give you energy more than sap your energy so i think um i think that's amazing Eddie. so th- thanks for that um I'd love to move on just to to the next one because it has been mentioned already today. Um, you know, like we talked about burnout, and I want to just go, delve a little bit deeper into it. So, is burnout closely linked to some of these mental health issues we've discussed? And can you share some of the tips actually that helped you through? You know, that year that you mentioned taking out that helped you sort of get your energy back and and get you feeling good again. Yeah, so actually there are different levels of burnout. And I think for me, it was the really serious one because as I mentioned, my body and my mind were not connected very well to each other. So the signal that I got was that I couldn't wake up anymore, you know. So from one day to another, I felt like I am exhausted. I don't have energy to do anything. Mm -hmm. I didn't even have energy to speak. So I... I was really desperate and I was really um, afraid as well because you you don't know what's happening and um, it's it's a really um, stressful moment yeah. actually. Um, so, but what what really helped me is that in Belgium the GPs are really um, um, how to say informed there and educated about these things. Mm-hmm. 
actually, uh, I was also so surprised when my GP told me 50% of her patients are going with mental health issues to her. Wow. So, which is which was really surprising to me because normally if you have a mental health issue, you go to the uh, psychiatrist or to a psychologist, but apparently here in Belgium, a lot of people go to their GP because this is the first contact, a contact that is that has um, trust. Yeah. I mean, the, they know the patient. They are the first person who will advise them. So they will they will tell about all their issues. So yeah. basically, the, the, the GP was really, really useful because she um, told me, uh, firstly, she, that she actually doesn't know. Uh, maybe it could be burned out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But she advised me to go to a therapist and discuss because actually it felt that something should be <laughs> should be tackled uh, through therapy. So she sent me to therapy. She also told me that I might need to take some medication because my state was really, really bad. So I had to get some energy back to be able to do something. And what she also suggested me to go to Kine. Mm-hmm. Um, so to have some Physical. kind of massage and, um, because also when you are stressed, um, then your back it hurts. Like you have yeah. also maybe a problem with the connection of your muscles and mind, etc. So mm-hmm. actually she prescribed me some kine sessions. So I went there, um, and I also uh, went to a center where people, um, taught me how to meditate or at least how to start um, relaxing my body, you know, when mm-hmm. when somebody is uh, starting telling you, okay, now uh, you just relax your legs, you relax your arms, etc. It was really bizarre the first time, but it was really putting me on the right path. So what, what really helped me a lot was a GP um, who didn't judge me, who listened to me, and who was competent and could uh, send me to the different professionals who could get me further help. Amazing. Well done. Well, well done you. And I think what you did there was um, maybe you didn't know it and maybe going to some of those Q&A sessions wasn't easy. You had to motivate yourself to get out the door. But I think what you were doing there was you were putting the wheels in motion to start feeling better again. And I think that's one thing that's really important for people who are depressed or feeling really down is they might get to a stage of where they feel a lack of hope. And I think hope is hugely important. So trying to create those, tr- create that hope again and see that hope. And I think what's really important as well is when you're feeling at your lowest is to realize that you have felt better before and that it is possible to get back there, even if you don't feel like it. And even if it feels exactly. like the yeah. things, but it can happen. And it's only a gradual thing that it happens. It's not going to be, unfortunately, it's not like, you don't just go from feeling so low to feeling great. Well, the problem is, again, you don't want to have those jumping emotions anyway. But, you know, it's, it's not something that's just not, not unfortunately, not like a light switch where you're going to feel better again and you're going to be able to just go. It, it is a process, like you mentioned. So well done. Yeah, exactly. What I mean, what my therapist told me, what was really striking me is that she, she told me it took you 30 years to get here. And you expect that you will be better in a month. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it was okay. I mean, hopefully it will not take another 30 years to feel better, but it was really a powerful sentence. So you really need to give time to your own body. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Um, Wow. Uh, There's so much in this and uh, like, I'm just delighted that that you've come on and and thanks for sharing so much of your wisdom. And I think what I want to talk to you though, just as we wrap up here um, is, so can you tell us about some of your wonderful uh, work as a social entrepreneur with your your social uh, business, Tuli Pain Design? Um, Because what an inspiration I've, I've been keeping track of you over the years and I just, told told me today there you have your page in English and French and it's amazing what you're doing so can you tell listeners a bit more about that yeah so basically it's linked to everything that we have been discussing today so basically after my burnout um, my therapist was uh, starting asking me questions what makes you happy Mm. what 
what kind of exercise you do that feels that that you are a child again you are um a careless child so uh, there is this exercise in therapy where they try to um move you you back to your um child self mm -hmm. and see what made you happy back then when you were a child a careless child and i told her well what made me happy when i was a child did to make things with my hands i was doing jewelry i was doing crochet and um and also being uh, close to nature i i had cats and dogs and i was always in the garden mm. so my therapist told me why not doing this more so when then i said oh well i'm in jewelry making i really love but i really dropped it because of course there are other things in life you need to study hard you need to find a job etc cetera, etc cetera. so i dropped it for a few years and then um, during my therapy, I started doing my jewelry and um, it came to my mind that actually I could develop a business out of that. And as, of course, this cause of preventing domestic violence is really important to me, mm -hmm. I develop a concept which is linking the two. So jewelry making that is really helping you feeling free and um, calm um, and in balance to the prevention of domestic violence. So this is how Tulipan Design was born uh, in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a social business uh, that is selling jewelry um, and also uh, providing um, some uh, creative workshops. Mm -hmm. So basically the social impact is that I'm donating money to the Center of Prevention of Domestic Violence in Belgium. And I am also trying to um, transmit um, the bed waving, the jewelry making as, as a meditation tool, as a tool for um, also healing for people who experience violence. So as, as we also discussed, uh, I'm also writing a blog where I'm um, talking uh, really openly about my uh, whole journey and also um, asking questions why, why things happen like this, why people are becoming abusive and why are victims, why victims don't leave sooner, etc. So, um, of course, I am not uh, a person who found, question, who found answers to all the questions. Yeah. Um, I'm still in the middle of that, but the social enterprise is up and running and um, you can check out on the page. There are a lot of interesting content and I'm also on social media. Amazing. Yeah. And I'm going to include in the show notes, I'll be including a link to um, Tuli Payne and I will be including a link to your blog as well. Um, so people can find out more about you because uh, it's amazing what you're doing. And I love what you said there about getting back to that carefree state of being in your childhood. And, uh, you know, for me, uh, something like that would be like playing football with friends. Like I, I, I play football again every Monday uh, for fun. It's like five aside. And it's what I call it is getting into the pure presence. It's uh, you're purely present. You're not thinking about anything else. You're not thinking about worries. You're not thinking yeah. about tomorrow. You're purely present there, kicking that ball or making that jewelry, whatever it is. And I think it's hugely important that people have what I call the, the vitamin F, fit, fit, the fun factor. You know, the <laughs> yeah. in their life and that pure presence where you can just be, you're in a state of being and um, yeah, ab absolutely amazing, Eddie. So just to wrap up, have you got any final message uh, for listeners um, to the show? Yeah, well, I mean, one, one thing that I learned is that you shouldn't be ashamed to ask for help. So um, since my burnout, I'm asking for help uh, all the time. <laughs> so before that, uh, for the first 30 years of my life, I was ashamed to ask for help. And um, I, I really had some tough time. I didn't even talk about it to my own mother, you know. Mm. Um, and yeah, I learned that actually it things will turn better if you ask for help and if you are talking about the issues. Mm. So um, it's nothing nothing bad is going to happen if you talk about it only good things can can happen as a consequence so this is this is a thing that i learned and and that's why i'm here to talk about this also to encourage other people younger people older people to talk about their issues because there is no shame um of uh, of suffering 
um, there are a lot of people who suffer, so let's not suffer in silence. Amazing. What a beautiful message to, to finish on. Uh, Eddie, you're amazing. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much uh, for having me. I, I'm, I'm really grateful for that opportunity.